As we spent time evaluating the uh, Major League Club, uh, it became clear to me that we would benefit from a change in leadership. Again, it's, a, it's an emotional time for me. Um, Manny approached me this winter about coming on the staff, so I'm still trying to process a lot of that right now um, and just really focus on the next 10 days and see uh, how we can finish strong. Well, it is an overcast, very humid evening here in Arlington as we get ready for the opening game of this weekend series with the Mariners at Globe Live Park. But it's a day where we heard more news here at the ballpark than anything else. Welcome, in everybody. I'm Dave Raymond. CJ Nikowski will be alongside here shortly. We'll hear from Emily Jones as well. The news today, uh, maybe a bit of a surprise to a lot of folks, and that is the very popular manager, Jeff Bannister relieved of his duties in just 10 games shy of what would be his fourth full season as the manager. John Daniels citing the need for a new voice of leadership. You look at what Banny accomplished in his nearly four seasons with the Rangers. 325 wins has him fourth in franchise history. The two division titles in his opening two years and as a rookie, the American League Manager of the Year. He certainly accomplished plenty in his short time here, but CJ, this is certainly an indication that the Rangers rebuild may be on a different path than we knew. Yeah, it could be. It's a really discouraging day, I think, for a lot of guys and certainly some shocking news. And whenever you're in that big league clubhouse, you're not really expecting your manager to change in the middle of the season. Yes, we're near the end, only 10 games to go. But certainly, I think, a difficult time for the guys as they process exactly what happened today. And this position has changed a little bit over the last couple of years. We saw it this past winter with the different hirings and a lot of inexperienced managers. And it sounded like organizations were looking for some different things out of their managers. So just a much different spot, I think, that we're in right now now and you just never know exactly what's going on in that clubhouse we speculate a lot from the outside so you're never exactly sure what it is that led to this yeah, it does seem that very much of it is about what happens in that clubhouse and how the players feel and for a little more on their reaction today we check in with emily jones yeah you guys mentioned the timing i think that's what caught most guys off guard was the fact that it did happen with just 10 games to go here in the regular season and as you guys mentioned uh, John Daniel citing the need for a fresh voice a new voice coming from that manager's office when I took uh, that information into the clubhouse and spoke with the players about it in particular Adrian Beltre how he would respond uh, to that line from John Daniels he said look we're all different we all communicate differently we all handle different types of communication differently but one thing about this clubhouse is that we're going to handle matters internally we're going to keep things inside here so uh, everybody may have a different reaction as to the firing of Jeff Bannister uh, and there won't be one blanket reaction he won't speak for anyone else but Adrian Beltre citing basically that they're going to keep those things in house uh, from here and and from here going forward. All right, thank you, Emily. And so it is a changing of the guard for the Rangers. Don Wakamatsu takes over as an interim manager from this point forward. One thing not changing, though, for the Rangers, and that is the continued experimentation with the opener. Connor Sadzik will get the shot again today, his second career big league start. We'll put the concept and the success of this experiment with the Rangers in the spotlight when we come back. Rangers baseball is brought to you by Ford. Visit your local Texas Ford dealer during the Ford SUV season. Ford is the best in Texas. By the new Shiner Wicked Juicy IPA. And by Southwest Airlines. Low fares, no hidden fees. That's transparency.
Rangers baseball is presented by the new Shiner Wicked Juicy IPA. And it is wicked juicy here today. Rain earlier this afternoon, more expected later on tonight. But for the time being, we have playable conditions here at Globe Light Park. The Rangers and the Mariners opening game of this series. And in our spotlight today, we're going to talk about the opener again. Yeah, so we have seen this now around Major League Baseball, but the Rangers have used it a few times, and I think it's safe to say that it has been successful so far. Sometimes you look at the first guy coming in and say, okay, well, if the opener pitches well, does that mean it is a success, or does it matter as far as what the guy who comes behind him, the primary pitcher? We've seen Gerardo do this three times. We saw Johan Mendez do it once, and you see the overall numbers, and for the most part, it has gone pretty well for the Rangers. You see that 3.48 combined ERA. We'll see it again this evening and I think right now the evaluation on how much the Rangers will use this going forward is kind of a work in progress. Well for Connor Sadzik it means another opportunity to make a start tonight against the Seattle Mariners. Mariners come in 84 wins and 68 losses. They're 11 back of Houston in the division eliminated from the division race but still the slim hope in the wild card race. Their lineup today Mitch Hanniger in the leadoff spot. Gene Segura at short, Robinson Cano at first. It's Cruz, Seeger, and Span in the middle. Ben Gamble in right field, bat seventh. Zanino catches, and D. Gordon at second base will round things out for the Mariners. Let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and take a look at the Shiner, new Shiner Wicked Juicy IPA pitch arsenal for Connor Sadzik. Four seam fastball, change up two seamer curveball, the slider that he will use as well so far for the rookie, and it's been a pretty successful campaign for him, and that change up has been very good for him. He has only allowed just a 100 batting average against. He also has not allowed a hit against the curveball or the slider yet so far. So far. The hard throwing right hander making his second big league start. It's, it's also pitched in relief on seven other occasions this year. Let's go ahead and take a look at the Rangers defense this evening, which is delivered to you by Demontron RV. It's Willie Calhoun, Joey Gallo, and Nomar Mazzara in the outfield this evening. And in the infield for the Rangers, you will see Adrian Beltre at third, Elvis Andrews at short, Rudin Odor at second, Jerkson Profar at first, and it is Robinson Chirinos behind the plate doing the catching. It brings up Mitch Hanniger to lead things off for Seattle. And Hanniger fairly recently has taken over the leadoff duties for the Mariners and that has gone quite well for him. Hanniger now this is the 38th game for him in that leadoff spot. Hitting 333 with eight home runs and 28 runs scored in those 37 previous starts in the leadoff spot. Scott Service really likes him there and he takes a strike to get it started tonight. There you go, 15 doubles as well. 78 degrees tonight with that first pitch. Overcast skies, lots of moisture in the air. And the breaking ball in there, the count 0 and 2. And a sharp 1 2 from Sadzik, and talked about this with him. We know he's got the good high velocity, high octane fastball, but the success that he has in the big leagues a lot of that will have to do with that breaking ball and that was a good one right there. Just off that outside corner at 99 miles per hour so there's a good power arm right out of the gate when you're an opposing hitter. So looked at uh, by March guys aren't used to seeing as they step to the plate for the first time in an evening. Yeah, I think that's part of it as well. It's not just what you're doing with your primary pitcher, right? That secondary guy who is being brought in to try to avoid seeing the middle of the lineup potentially a third time around, but then also disrupting the rhythm of those first couple of hitters in the order. As you mentioned, seeing a power arm especially, or even if it's Alex Claudio, right, the funky lefty, whatever it is, has a much different look for hitters to start off a game than they're used to. Off the plate, and Hanniger has run the count full. It almost strikes me... We talk a lot about how difficult pinch hitting is in the big leagues. In some ways, it's got a similar feel, right? I mean, sure. you're coming off the bench cold, right? You're just leading off the ball game, and you're seeing a guy, <laughs> the type of guy you might see in one of those tough late inning spots. Three-two. Oh, 
just missed and Hanniger draws the lead off walk. 97 mile an hour fastball looked like it might have caught the down and in corners really close. And Sadzik does not get the call. That has been one issue for him so far as the walks and it's been limited action for him in the big leagues but the walks and the strikeouts have been an even one for one. Connor Sadzik. So Hanniger with his lead at first and Gene Segura going right after strike one. Now one of those walks was intentional but five walks five strikeouts coming into this one and his six and a third so far in the big leagues. Not a huge lead for Hanniger and he's not going. Segura with a pop up out into short center. Gallo now drifts back a couple of steps. And there's one away. So the Mariners mentioned still alive in the wild card chase but boy the start of the season they were so good really one of the great stories in baseball 55 and 31 into Independence Day but since July 4th this is a team eight games under 500 the offensive production has gone down quite a bit the pitching has hit some rough patches. And now seven and a half back in that chase for the second wild card. They need pretty much a perfect finish from here. Not only that, but they need help. Now weren't they? Didn't they have a pretty good record in one-run games too? Or, right? They were an amazing crushing record. it, right? Yeah. And that was one of those things that, and I don't always fall into this camp, but some folks do. They look at it and say, "Well, that can't continue. <laughs> That's going to be a problem at some point. You can't continue to dominate one-run games. You can if your bullpen is really on. You have a smaller." margin for error but certainly I think things did indeed catch up to the Seattle Mariners inside and it is two and zero oh on Robinson Cano Excuse people me. were saying that what was it two years ago with the Rangers that incredible record that yep. they had but that continued throughout the year they were able to sustain that but to the great frustration I think of a lot of opponents right I mean <laughs> yeah. that, that's and that's part of it too even with the Mariners this year people would see what was going on and they and it would it would be aggravating to say well you can't keep winning those games like that it's statistically speaking it's just it is not reliable high chopper to first what a play by Profar to get up and grab it and he'll put out Cano for the second out of the inning what a nice play by Jerks and Profar and talked a lot about his year and how he has moved around all the different infield positions so far this year and Playing third base is not the same as playing first. You're on the complete opposite side. You get different bounces, and you see him get up here and corral this ball. Does a nice job of getting back in plenty of time. We know Robinson Cano wanted to maybe not always bust it out of the box, and so it's an easy 3U for Jerks after he makes that very nice play. So Hanniger now out at second for Nelson Cruz, but there are two out. And he takes strike one. So here you go. One run games. Yep. Seattle is 36 and 21. That's still that's that's really good. Mm -hmm. And games decided by two runs. They're 16 and six. How about this extra innings? 13 and one. So yeah, they have had a lot of success winning those close ones late. Cruz takes another strike to count 0 and 2. Connor Sadzik a walk and the fly out and the ground out and the big right hander one strike away from putting up a zero in the first inning who stays alive it's another good year for Nelson Cruz it really is amazing to watch what he has done as he gets later and later in his career this is age 37 season although he is 38 years old he's that guy that's got the borderline birthday July 1st so if he was born a day earlier this would it would change it right I think as a go at the end of whatever it is another day would make this his actual age 38 season nevertheless he is 38 years old and just another big year 36 home runs with 90 RBIs uh, he's top 10 in the league and. Home runs, RBI, slugging percentage. He is our TXU Energy 
power player to watch. How about this? The only player with 35 or more home runs in each of the last five seasons is Mr. Consistency. He's also a free agent at the end of the year. Man, it's going to be an interesting one to watch, right? Because we've seen those price tags come down, but something to be said for consistency. The fact, obviously, that you can DH him, and you'd prefer to DH him. So you've got to believe there's at least 15 teams that would have some kind of interest in <laughs> Nelson Cruz to have that kind of area. It really comes down to, I guess, what he's looking for because we've seen the prices come down of all these hitters, but man, he's been really good. And you know, the batting average you look at and say maybe nothing special at 262, but he's been good in these spots. Runners in scoring position, he's hitting over 300. This guy still knows how to hit. He's worked the count to two and two. And it's now full. I guess it's, you don't want to be the team that gets caught, you know, right? Like how much longer is it going to happen? At some point, it's going to slow down. I was talking to Dave Sims earlier and just kind of spitballing on what you could potentially see. Dave Sims, of course, one of the voices of the Seattle Mariners, but what you could potentially see for a contract. You know, do you go two years with a really high AAV? Does he try to get three, right? You get a lot of guys that try to get the most amount of years that they possibly can guaranteed. Three's probably pushing it, I got to believe, taking into his age 41 season. Well, a big payoff pitch here, and he takes that one outside, and Cruz has drawn a walk. So two walks here in the first. So Nelson Cruz, we talked about five straight years of 35 or more home runs. The only guy right now in baseball able to claim that. You look historically, uh, players with five or more years at 35 or more home runs, at their age, right, at 33 and older. Aaron, Bonds, Babe Ruth, Rafael Palmero joining Cruz on that list. It's amazing. That is a handsome list. And that's the thing we have to be careful, right, is that a lot of times we have these conversations about age. And we say, well, you know, this is a number you want to stay away from. But not everybody. Age is the same. Some guys, obviously, worse than others, present company included. <laughs> you know. Oh, you're all right. <laughs> you're all right. Don't worry. <laughs> no, I, it, it, it's a it's a conundrum of sorts for Seattle. That's the other thing, right? I mean, it certainly seems to be comfortable. It seems to work well for him in that Mariners, uh, whatever, system situation. I mean, he's good in that clubhouse. He is a very well-liked player, it seems like, no matter where he has been. Well, I would... I'd be awfully intrigued if the Mariners did not find a way to bring him back as Sadzik gets the first one in there now to Kyle Seeger. Seeger has struggled against the Rangers this year, a 176 average, but uh, don't be fooled by that. A guy who has found a way over the years to do more than his fair share of damage. Takes another strike, 0 and 2. And Santa continues to jump ahead of these Mariners hitters. Now we'll see if he can put Seeger away. There is activity in the Rangers pin. So you have Martin Perez up right now to potentially finish off the inning. And then Gerardo, who is going to be used as that primary pitcher, to come and exit. So he has to throw in case the inning ends now, and he's used to that starter's routine. He needs a little bit more time. This one in the air out to center field. Gallo. Going back on it, and he makes the play. That ball is carrying pretty well. Inning is done. And the Rangers managed to strand two. Well, welcome back, Joey Gallo. I guess the toe feels okay as he ranges to his right, reaches up, makes a nice play in deep center field.
take their hacks tonight. 64 wins, 88 losses in our Southwest Airlines starting lineup. Chu leading it off as a DH. Profar at first. Elvis Andrews at short. In the middle of the order, it's Mazzara, Beltre, and Odor. Chirinos does the catching. Gallo back in the lineup in center field. And Willie Calhoun in left will bat ninth. That all against Erasmo Ramirez making his 10th start of the year. Two and three record of 565 ERA. And gets one right in there for a strike. Two, just a shade under 270 for the year. 21 homers, 62 RBIs. A great year for Chu, start to finish. On base up over 380. He's been very consistent, and he's managed to stay healthy. That's been such a big key for him. Won't we'll take the bait on that one. One and two. Ramirez this year has given up some home runs. 13 of them in 43 innings. This ball out over short in the center field. That's a base hit. And Chu is on to start the night for the Rangers. Take a look at the replay here on the Chu base hit that finishes out left center field. Good look at that kind of change up grip. As that ball fades away, it finishes off the plate, but this is what Chu does so well. You see him kind of reaching, staying balanced, and just slapping that thing into center field. Yeah, you mentioned those home runs. They've been an issue, but they've come in bunches. Kind of a weird way that Ramirez has gotten there. He allowed three home runs in his last game. He allowed three in his previous six games combined. And then he let up five home runs in a game <laughs> on April 27th. I thought, well, that must be pretty weird. Almost like four or five other guys that have done that this year, allowing five home runs in a game. That was right before he went on the DL back in April. And he's had a couple of stents on the disabled list this year. The man on, Profar. It's this one foul in the count on one two. Turkson with 18 home runs and 74 RBIs. No good all round season for Jerickson Profar today getting the start at first base. Yeah, there you have it. Career highs in those two big run production categories. And an OPS closing in on 800 for the year. That'd be nice to get to that number. Finish the year at 800 or better and is on base plus slugging. Oh, absolutely. I think that's I think one of the more common numbers that if you're looking for one that you can universally get. A lot of people to kind of wrap their brains around and agree whether they're in the industry or just fans. OPS, as you mentioned, the on base and the slugging, and to see him well above league average is definitely a good sign for Jerkson. Oh, Rasmus Ramirez strikes him out for the first out of the inning. Well, that'll give us an opportunity to take a look at the pitch arsenal for Ramirez, which is presented by the new Shiner Wicked Juicy IPA. And now a lot of pitches here: four seam fastball, cutter, changeup, slider, and curveball. And there's actually a two seam fastball in there. I combine those together the four seamer and the two seamer and it's just a full repertoire for this right hander and you'll actually see most of those fastballs are two seamers over four seamers so the idea of trying to get ground balls is part of the plan there for Ramirez not a huge strikeout guy just six and a half strikeouts per nine but he does a nice job of filling up the strike zone his walk rate 2.1 walks per nine innings that is an excellent rate. Andrews at the right side and takes a little bit in. Elvis, six home runs, 32 RBIs this year. A year interrupted by a two month stay on the disabled list. This is the first time in his career that he had to visit the DL. And Elvis has managed to. Get himself back, and he's had some stretches where he's played really well. Lately, in a bit of a scuffle. 116 average over the last 11 games. And he takes low, it's 2 and 1.
But earlier there was a stretch. He had a 19 game hitting streak. He's tied for the longest in baseball this year. Three and one. I think what we have seen with Elvis this year, right, dealing with that first time on the DL, that was difficult for him, no two ways about it. And then trying, I think, after coming off a career year last year, you want to replicate that. Now, obviously, the counting numbers aren't going to get there after you miss a significant amount of time. But I think we saw him pressing a little bit. We saw him running into some bad luck. And we've seen him chase a little bit up out of the zone. That's got to be tough for him. I mean, you're trying to put yourself in his shoes. And that was a monster season he had a year ago and not his fault that he got hurt on that pitch that got away from Middleton. And you want to prove that last year wasn't a fluke and I think when you get into those spots you probably press a little bit to try to get those numbers back up quickly. Three one pitch and that one is off the plate for ball four so the Rangers have two men on she was running. But he'll stop at second. Andrews on via the walk. And so something building here with the first. Let's take a look at the Maris Mariners defense, which is sponsored by Jack in the Box, Denard Span, Mitch Hanniger, and Ben Gamble in the outfield for Scott Services Club. And in the infield, it's Kyle Seeger, Gene Segura, Deke Gordon, Robinson Cano at first base, and Mike Zanino behind the plate. So set up nicely now for Nomar Mizarro. 20 home runs on the year, 74 RBIs for Nomar. His average close to 265. And he'll take strike one. And ten of his last 16 hits have been for extra bases. One of the few guys who has pretty decent numbers against Ramirez. Three for six against him. And the count one and one. Yesterday an off day for the Rangers. A little break for everybody including Nomar one one pitch that's low Nomar since coming back from the disabled list. Now this is his 29th game since returning. He's hitting 238. We see this with a lot of guys right now the. The numbers may be down just a little bit. In terms of average. On base, last couple of weeks have been tough. He's been really good in these spots, though. And I'm listen. There's not a hitter in the league that doesn't like getting ahead. And when he has been in these spots so far this year, he's hitting 452. And the pitcher gets by. Now league average is high at 356, and you would expect that. But he has been nearly 100 points better than league average. Out to left field, but Span is right there, and there are two away. And hit the third baseman, number 49, Adrian Beltre. Well, that'll leave it up to Adrian Beltre. How about that? Five doubles in the last five games. And they have really come in bunches lately for him. He's had a great month of September. Just when you think, right? Well, yeah. of course, age has got to get you. Sooner or later, just when you think, oh, is he getting Adrian a little bit? And here he is in September, where you would think he might be his most tired and fatigued, and he'll maybe not be able to drive the ball as much as we're used to seeing. No, it's been the opposite. That's what's been so amazing about Adrian Beltre. This one deep out to right field, carrying toward the wall. It is good. And Beltre has left the yard again. 14th home run of the season.
Ranger strike first tonight. Three nothing on the Beltre long ball. Look out. <laughs> Helmet off. He's keeping an eye on any teammates that might be feeling a little bit frisky. <laughs> And Chu trying to plead his case <laughs> in that spot, but really unbelievably amazing to watch here as we were just talking about as this smoke is having a hard time, I guess, getting through the little thicker sky that we're dealing with tonight because everyone is just kind of standing around and realizing that was a great shot right there. Kyle Seeger. You may want to let things clear a little bit. <laughs> But it really is amazing to see that what happens in these spots with Adrian Beltre. It's incredible that he can still do that this late in the year at 39 years old, being opposite field home runs. Or on the next pitch. Pops this one up in his short left field. Span comes in, and that will do it. But the Rangers get on the board first. Adrian Beltre with a three-run bomb. Well, there he does it. The future Hall of Famer goes opposite field at 300. And 77 feet to hit that ball 100 miles per hour. Adrian Beltre does it again. by a score of three to nothing and it's thanks to this Adrian Beltre home run and you're going to see this fastball up over the plate and watch Adrian drive it the other way and Stackcast AI is powered by AWS that launch angle of 30 degrees. Luckily Stackcast will not count the error on that fan but the opportunity of a lifetime that we ended up high-fiving his buddy who did get the ball so I guess you get to kind of sort of keep it in the family but that was a golden opportunity we saw what happened with Adrian's last home run. Fan took great advantage of his opportunity, reeled it in with the glove in left field. And that is why you bring your glove to the ballpark. Yes, it is. Ariel Harado goes to work now in the second inning. So Harado will get Span, Gamble, and Zanino. There are those numbers, just like Connor Sadzik, very similar with the walk to strikeout ratio, pretty even at uh, one to one, and even one to one for him. And, Sadzak like had one more walk than strikeout coming into this game. And so these rookies figuring it out. As they navigate their way through big league lineups for the first time. Morado, a guy that you don't look at for a lot of swing and miss. That's not what his game is about. It's the ground balls. It's a good use of the sinker. A two-seat fastball, which you will see 62% of the time. Span lifts this one out to center field. The right to Joey Gallo. Run away. Uh, let's take a moment now to hear from the folks over at Southwest Kia. At Southwest Kia, we make car buying easy. $250 down delivers, monthly payments, $250 a month or less. SouthwestKia.com. One out for Ben Gamble now. Gamble, left-handed hitter. 
And he takes a strike. Well, just one home run and 16 RBIs this year for Gamble. It's jammed up there. The count 0 and 2. I wonder, do you, do you think Scott Service at all, how he kind of planned his lineup out this evening with the five lefties that are in there? Do you do you focus on and you believe the primary pitcher, the secondary pitcher coming in? Is Herodos had some issues with lefties this year? They're hitting 382 against him. If you put him especially near the bottom of the order, knowing that's probably when he's coming in the game. Right? If the goal is to keep that primary pitcher away from facing the middle of the lineup a third time through but the bottom of the order potentially you could face three times through but put some tough hitters there especially some lefties just wonder if that kind of counteracts or takes away a little bit from the strategy that's the back and forth that happens here yeah I mean so I've maintained that I think if opposing managers begin to construct their lineups for the opener concept mm -hmm. that you're winning. Yeah. By forcing them to do so. This one lined out to second, and O'Dor makes another nice play. Two away. But that said, you know, if you've got some parts that to you feel you know, more or less equal, to your point, Seeger, Span, Gamble, all lefties in a row, and then Zanino giving way to another lefty in D. Gordon. I mean, he's definitely stacked it with a lot of lefties down there. And if you figure you're going to see Hirado, that first inning is a time usually to get starters. I. It makes some sense to me. It's not like you're going to put Nelson Cruz down in no. the seventh spot. I don't think you will see a manager do that, but he may think twice about what he's doing with his bottom of the order. That's the part I think that is interesting. Is it worth it? I wonder what those conversations are like with your analytics department, managers, your hitting coaches, all of that. Zanino, the flare out over center, or rather second base into center field, and he is aboard. So Andy Green did that when we were in San Diego and he he admitted it. He said before the ball game, yeah, I, one little tweak I made uh, in concession. And as I recall, it, well, it wasn't a big one. And I don't think it really had a, uh, you know, a marked effect on the game. But I did think it was interesting that you would even consider that. And then the next part of that is how do players feel about it? Is it frustrating for them? Because we've already talked about a lot utility players moving guys around. You don't know what position you might be playing that day, at least for some certain guys. We know where that guy's going to be playing, whether it's DH or third base. But you know, there's a lot of moving around. Jerks and Profar are a good example, right? Where is he going to be every day is always somewhat of a little bit of a mystery. But then now it comes down to, well, are we facing a team that's using an opener? Is there opener righty or lefty? What is their primary guy? What does that mean for my playing time? And if you're looking for consistency, because the old adage was players love coming in, knowing where their name's going to be in the lineup and where they're going to be playing. Well, that is starting to become reserved for just a special few. Yeah, I feel like those days are well past us. We just don't see it anymore. There are very, very few guys or teams that have a real structured lineup that you expect to see night after night. Ground ball to the right side of that one is through for Gordon. And so the Mariners have a couple of men on here in the second. Now the top of the order coming. Hey, be here tomorrow night. The last Saturday home game this year. These same two teams, Rangers Mariners, 705 first pitch. And all fans are going to receive a voucher for a free ticket to select games in 2019. Get your tickets now, TexasRangers.com, by calling 972 Rangers. Just two games remaining on the home schedule after tonight. Seven of the final ten against the Seattle Mariners. Yeah. We haven't played the Astros since when? July? July, yeah, late July. Weird schedule. Breaking ball, that one catches a corner. One and one to count on Mitch Hanniger. So Arado in his first inning of the night as the primary pitcher coming in on the back of Connor Sadzik. Hanniger in the leadoff spot, but a good run producer and a guy you have to be respectful of. 
And Hanniger has 90 RBIs. He's in the top 10 in the league. That's a perfect example of how a leadoff guy gets his opportunities. We're just talking about stacking the lineup, maybe using some of those lefties, and your eight and nine hole hitters get a couple of base hits. I mean, there's opportunities. If D. Gordon is batting ninth. You know your leadoff guy is going to get some RBI opportunities. Off the plate, two and two. He's in that spot as D. Gordon, where he's had a hard time getting on base, well below 300 on the on base percentage this year, but he can still make some things happen once he gets on the bases. Really makes some happen. Walked into the bat. Out toward left of center, but handled by Gallo, and that will end the inning. And so for the second inning in a row, the Mariners lead two out there. Rangers with a 3-0 lead. game time I am a sucker for a handwritten note and Kitty Thompson left me a handwritten note saying she should be the progressive fan of the game because she has the sweetest kicks at the ballpark so I came to find oh. out if that's true and let me tell you something guys oh absolutely is Kitty tell me the story behind these I just have a couple of other pairs of shoes made by this same guy and I called him and I said can I have some custom made ones with the Ranger logo on the toe, and he said, sure. So I got them. Very snazzy. You get a lot of compliments on those? All the time. Yeah, we'll consider this oh. the latest. They're looking good, girl. Progressive fan of the game for those kicks, guys. Oh, nice. They look comfortable. The socks weren't too shabby either. Those are pretty cool. Now, the handwritten note issue, I don't know about you, but my handwriting is, that's gone in the tank, man. Digital age is killing handwriting. How about yourself? Can you still write a nice uh, note? Well, I've never had good handwriting. Yeah. yeah. My mom threatened to take me out of school and homeschool me when I was in second really? grade. Yeah. Because my handwriting was so sloppy. <laughs> she, and she's like, no recess, oh. no lunch with all the other kids. Really? You'll yeah. just be here. We'll get that handwriting <laughs> correct. It's like, jeez. And? Eh, never got any better. Really? So was that, I uh, called her bluff. She didn't want me home nice. all day. <laughs> that's, that's a good point. <laughs> Oh, I wrote two notes today and they were absolutely atrocious. It's embarrassing. No spell check in my hand either. Which is yeah, a that's the killer for me. I before you. What was that rule? Oof. It's embarrassing. Now full count here to Robinson Chirinos leading off the second inning. Chirinos, Gallo, and Calhoun. And this one fouled over to the right side out of play. Robinson doing the catching today, batting seventh. 17 homers and 62 RBIs for Chirinos. So he's had a really good year in that respect. Driving in runs, 
providing the power again. This one out to right center field and hangs up just long enough for Ben Gamble to get there. And away. Right now, Joey Gallo. And Gallo, another guy who has some good numbers against Erasmo Ramirez and also has shown some power. Now, this is all the way back in late April. And that slightly opposite field for those guys in the bullpen who pretended like yeah. they didn't even see it. Not even a flinch. They knew that ball was easily going to clear all their heads out there. And it's kind of always part of it. You remember these things as a pitcher. You remember home runs, and you should. But you remember the big ones, the opposite field home runs you remember a lot. And then you go through that process and asking yourself, OK, do I want to be a guy who's responsible for another one of those dents in the wall? Probably not. All right, so what do I do about it? Is it was it a bad pitch on my part? Is that a strength of his? Has he done that to other righties? And you go through all of that. Ramirez certainly has, and that's what the reports are for, and all that advanced scouting. And he tries to come up with a game plan, and so far that game plan is don't throw a strike. So if you cut the field in half mm -hmm. through the pitcher's mound, second base, and over to the left side, and he hit that ball to the left side, there's only one defender on the left side of the field, and I mean the entire field. Yeah. Denard Span. No, Out there and left, there's right. no infielder. And the only guy to the left of, I mean, so they don't think that Gallo's going that way here again. Which is amazing, right? The highlight that we just showed you. Yeah. And we know he doesn't go opposite field too much. And the reality is, if he does, it's probably going to be something high in the air or it's going to be over the fence. They didn't defend that one. Well, the little trickler down the first baseline turns foul. Two and two. Really be showing me something if you position somebody there. But Joey Gallo just does not hit very many ground balls to the left side. I mean, you, you take a look right there. I mean, that is absolutely amazing. Nothing. You have more umpires on that side of the field than you have defenders. You have better chance of drilling an umpire <laughs> than hitting it at a player. That is amazing. Van over at third. Rackley at second. Now the 2 2. That one low and inside. Full count. Now there's a reason behind it. Why do they shift Joey Gallo? Because they know he's dead pull. It's pretty amazing what we're seeing. We should take a look at his overall numbers for the year. That career high 87 RBIs for Joey Gallo. And he certainly would love to add on. Be tough to get to that century mark here with 10 to go, but won't be for lack of effort. No, well, he takes his 71st walk of the season. No, well, he is aboard here for Willie Calhoun. Just as just as happy and just as willing to take those walks these days. Calhoun, a couple of homers and 11 RBIs. 244 batting average this year. And he'll pop this one down the left field line, but into the seats. Foul. Rangers got three runs in the first inning on the, the Beltre homer. Calhoun two for 17 with a homer since his second call up this year. It's just the fifth start that he has had called up on September 4th from Triple A Round Rock. Way outside and it is two and one. This is Calhoun's second season in the Rangers organization. Last year acquired by Texas in the deal that sent you Darvish to the Dodgers. Young hitting prospect. Still learning his way defensively. Bounces this one up the middle. Gordon waits on it. Quick flip for one. Segura relays it to first in time for the double play. 4-6-3 ends the inning. And if two in the books so far, Rangers lead it 3-0.
low fares, no hidden fees. That's transparency. And by the new Shiner Wicked Juicy IPA. Globe Life Park tonight as we go to the third inning and Gene Segura will start things off for the Mariners. Segura, Cano, and Nelson Cruz. Opening game in this final home series of the season. A bouncer to shortstop. Andrews with a good strong throw, one away. That's the best version. It might sound silly. It was one pitch, one at bat, but that's the version of Hirado that you really want to see. I mean, Gene Segura obviously is a really good hitter. If he can keep that two seam fastball in the zone, keep the movement from not going horizontal, but getting a little bit of vertical on it, that up to down so you get hitters to swing early and hit the top half of the ball. That's what you want. We've seen him have his good games. That is when that's when he's on. That's what works. And he's just got to figure out how can I do that consistently, not just throw strikes, but get the movement that he wants on that two seam fastball consistently. And then the last part is finding the secondary pitches that'll work best. He doesn't use them a ton, but he still needs to have them. You know, the big swing and a miss, one and one. Last time up, Cano bounced one down to first. It was a real high hopper down there for Profar. And he is 0 for 1. Jerickson all over the diamond these days. I suppose a couple years ago might be a place where you would not have expected to find Profar. Say the same about Cano. That's where he has yeah. started tonight. Three and one the count. Served an 80 game suspension this year for violation of Major League Baseball's drug policy and once he came back is sort of had to figure out where he can fit in. And then he takes the walk here in the third inning. All right our big story as we like to call it. And uh, we knew it was coming but the Boston Red Sox with their third straight American League East Division title and they finally clinched it yesterday in New York their 104th win of the season with what 10 games to go so nine games I guess to go for Boston so we'll see what that final number ends up looking like but what a year it has been that's a sweet one for them because they get to do it in the Bronx listen they'd love to do it at home but if you can't do it at home the next place you'd like to do it if you're a Boston Red Sox is right there in Yankee Stadium and that's exactly what they did and it's probably even a little bit sweeter got a couple of rookie managers there Alex Cora Aaron Boone but I believe that the majority of people that were trying to handicap the American League East they were giving it to the Yankees this offseason after they picked up Stanton added him to the lineup with guys like Judge and assuming Gary Sanchez was going to be healthy there was all kinds of talk of what kind of records they could set and how easily they were going to win that division and it was actually the Boston Red Sox when it was all said and done by a pretty healthy margin. The second largest division lead and division capture this year in baseball. Cleveland will end up more than likely with a, a bigger margin. The Indians with a 14 game lead over Minnesota. The Indians also with the fewest wins among any division leaders in all of baseball but they just happen to play in a bad division. What Boston did in a great division is that much more amazing. The one two. Cruz takes outside. One out Cano at first base. Cruz walked in the first inning but that was against Sadzik. He swings and misses here. A foul tip into Torino's glove. Two away. Time for a Chevy game break. Let's check in with John Radigan.
Good, buddy. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Over and out. Uh, that's been a rough White Sox season. 92 losses. And you know, they're season long over. I can't imagine the delight in upsetting anything the Cubs are trying to do. It's okay. huge. And Milwaukee still has a shot at taking that division. Two and a half back coming into play today. Just enough time left. Let's take a look at the National League Central. So now up to the minute, a two game difference. And those two games in the loss column as well as the win column. So Cardinals five back. They're not going to win the Central Division. But the Cardinals, a great chance of the wild card. There's a strike, two and one. So we always talk about schedule and say things like you look at, right? Just as the White Sox beat the Cubs, and at some point, well, they got a softer schedule. Well, the Milwaukee Brewers. They're playing the Pirates tonight. They're losing to the Pirates right now, three to one. They're in a delay. They're five and eleven against the Pirates Ooh. this year. To think that that is what was going to get in the way of them winning a division, right now six games under. Even if they had gone five hundred. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> that's right. To think that they could have won a division had they taken care of business against a team like the Pittsburgh Pirates and that's not a knock on the Pirates just not having a great year not a team that you expect the Milwaukee Brewers with the year that they are having to be five and eleven and they're losing tonight three to one. Who is it though. There's somebody in the National League I, I think the National League. Who's been just. Stopped by the Reds this year. And a bad year for the Reds. They just can't seem to beat them. This one fouled away. By Seeger keeps the count at two and two. That's the Brewers, the Brewers are third, they went 13 and six against the Reds this year. But you run into those teams and it happens and it's pretty crazy when it does. And you kind of left there scratching your head, but that's what's great about our game. Might be the Dodgers. Dodgers having trouble with the Reds this year. Look here. The Dodgers, look, by the way, the Dodgers those... are uh, yes, they're six and one. The Reds are Reds against are six the Dodgers. Ones, yeah. So the Dodgers won one of the seven games that they played this year against the Reds. This one high in the air out to short right field. Andrews <laughs> takes it with a little traffic out there. There's Buddy Odor, but the inning is done. And so we played two and a half so far. Rangers lead 3-0. Juicy IPA. It is a 3 nothing Rangers advantage as we head to the bottom of the third inning. And Shin Su Chu will lead it off. So top of the order here is Erasmo Ramirez. Bounces the first one up there. Did I get a, pit, a piece of uh, Chu? It did apparently. Just nicked him and so 
Chu is on to strike the third. Take a look here. Looks like a slider grip down and in. Did it catch him on the top of the shoe? It did. It looked like it might have hit the ground first. Not that that matters. Eighty-third time this year, a Rangers batter has been plunked. Profar takes one down there. That might not be fair usage of the word plunk. Good point. Well, that wasn't really a plunking. Not a plunking. Been hit by a pitch anyway. So Chu is on. And Chu, by the way, was six stolen bases this year. Small lead. Damp surface. And that one finds the edge of the zone for a strike to profile one and one. So I would not have known that. One of those things I probably don't pay that close attention to, but that the Rangers are second in baseball. The hitters have been hit the second most in the game. Did you know that? Yeah, I, well, only because uh, Stevie and I have been <laughs> all summer keeping close count of it. They, they get hit all the time. So the Rays are leading all of Major League Baseball. They have been hit 93 times coming into tonight. The Padres have only been hit 30 times, the least in baseball. Which there's a joke to be made there. I know which one you're. I can see you smiling already. It's not nice. Not a nice joke. One-two pitch, and Profar stays alive. As my wife likes to tell me, there's a little bit of truth in every joke. <laughs> there, there often is. It's true. Well, I mean, she uses that if I case I don't make any joke about her. I'm just joking. No, 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 no. I think you really think that. I think sometimes there are jokes that are just meant to be jokes. <laughs> Bouncer by first. So Profar is on. Two heads to third base. Jerickson will dive into second. Although no throw is coming. A hit batter and a double to start the third. That's a great job there by Jerks and Profar. A hustle double. And he understands the surface tonight. You're just talking about how damp it is and also the fact that he didn't hit this very hard. And as soon as he made this contact, he realized this was going through. He was thinking about that double, and that's the way you got to do it. We went through that with Tony Beasley. We had our little ignite the other night, and the idea of always thinking a base ahead and how important that turn is. Stay aggressive. That's a really nice read, and Profar gets in there easily. So, great RBI spot now for Elvis. He walked in the first inning. Ooh, trying to hold up that swing. You see him adjusting that pad on that right elbow. A similar play earlier this year against the Angels when he turned in on a pitch like that. Came riding in on him, hit him on that elbow, broke a bone in that elbow, and forced him to miss two months. Looked like that hit the bat and then hit mm -hmm. the elbow potentially. Pretty frustrating. Let's see that one more time to see exactly what happened on that check swing. Two seam fastball running in. It caught some bat. No, I guess it didn't catch the elbow. Ooh. Ooh, visit here in the third inning. We got mid at bat pitching coach visit. You don't see that too often. You don't in our Southwest Airlines bullpen live look. They're getting ready out there right now. So I wonder that could be one of two things right where you actually saw something that you wanted addressed or you realized if a big hit comes here you want to make sure you have your lefty to face Nomar Mazzara who is sitting on deck and the way that Stalemar went out there jogged back in a little bit I don't know if that was necessarily about buying more time for his reliever but nevertheless an unusual kind of visit in the middle of a bat at bat. 1-1. One, one. And that one popped up on the infield. 
Pete Gordon finds it. And that is out number one. So it brings up Nomar Mazzara. 0 for 1. He flied out to left field in the first inning, but going back again early in the season, back in April. And it was Mazzara, this one, who pretty much, well, just to the right of straightaway center field. And that was a bomb. <laughs> one of 20 this year for Nomar. There's a bullpen there, right center field. That one was a line shot, too. And we know when Nomar is swinging his best bat. He's not a launch angle guy, doesn't hit the ball high in the air. It's those line drives, but certainly has plenty of power to get those out of the ballpark. Infield stays in about halfway, as they did with Andrews. Looks like they'll try to cut the runoff pretty much every spot except for a ground ball hit to the right side, at least the first base side, I should say. If it goes to D. Gordon at second, they probably would try to make a play on Chu, but if it goes to Cano at first, probably not. Let's hit real hard. Right, that's the spot when you look at Cano and the way that he's playing deep on the first base side there, of course, you're thinking if Nomar Mazzara pulls a ground ball, they don't want to give him the opportunity to get it through, right? So you back up further to give yourself some more range. You concede the one run. You don't want it to happen, but you'll likely concede the one. If you play up, you risk that chance of two scoring if that ball gets through. Mazzara chases in the dirt. One and two the count. For Cano, it's just his ninth start at first base. Mentioned that when he came back from his suspension, Jerry DePoto, the general manager, said well, he's going to play a lot of first base. We like what D. Gordon's been doing at second. Well, he has played some first. He's played a little third. And he's also gotten back in there at second. But still a new position for him. There's D. Center fielder turned second baseman. Well, that's low, two and two. He's still done most of his work at second. So what do you think going forward? D. Gordon is under control. Robinson Cano's got a couple of more years on that deal. You try to just make him a full time first baseman. Nelson Cruz, we mentioned, is a free agent. Would you want to use Robinson Cano as just your DH? Ooh, strike three call. Mazzara down looking two away. Now, Nomar didn't like that one. He thought that that pitch was in off the plate. Working hard. This one was really, really close. Take a look at this. Fox tracks had it uh, probably maybe catching a little bit of the corner or just in. It's a little cutter, didn't have a lot of movement. I think Nomar probably thought that ball was going to move a little bit more. And you work so hard into that bat and you feel like you were successful. And then to have it taken away from you like that, at least the way that Nomar believes it was, is always a little frustrating. So Beltre, who has driven in all the runs tonight, a home run back in the first inning that, by the way, he came into the game tied with Stan Musial and Willie Stargell with 475 career homers. And that home run of the first moved him past those two Hall of Famers. Now 30th on the all time list by himself on the count 0 2. Next stop Lou Gehrig and Fred McGriff. My goodness. <laughs> that is super cool. Well, this one lifted in the air to the right side, but foul. You never really hear Adrian talk very much about his own accolades. It's not something he's comfortable doing. And then also, a lot of players will tell you that you feel like you're starting to come to terms with the end while you're still out there competing and preparing. That's really difficult to do. But it's hard not to wonder, at least for us, we like round numbers, right? So, you know, is there 500 in there? Does he have it? I, I mean, certainly a full season he could get there. And I wonder. How much Adrian, you know, deep down, if he does care about that at all, to go 3,000 hits with 500 home runs? One and two. You know, I don't know. I don't know. It's 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 tough. He's he's a tough one to read in general, but 
which has been so hard, I think, the last couple of years staying healthy. And all the work that goes into just getting himself out there every day. I don't know. He's still a blast to watch, though. One, two. And that one is outside. Two balls and two strikes. One of the all time greats. And to your point, we may be watching him here at home for the last time this weekend. 2 2 pitch inside, and it's a full count. Emily, what do you have? Well, we had a conversation today, Adrian and I did, about you know, those numbers and is there anything out there left that he feels like he hasn't done? And he said, you know, aside from winning a World Series, I really feel like I've accomplished everything I want to in my career. I've done everything I wanted to do uh, personally and even as a team other than win that World Series. This one dropped out into right field, base hit. Two runs in on a single by Beltre. And it's 5 nothing Rangers. He's driven in all five. Absolutely amazing. He hits the opposite field home run at 100 miles an hour in his first at bat. He gets down in the count 0 2, fouls off a pretty tough cutter, works it to a full count, gets another tough cutter right here, borderline pitch, and he reaches out. And as Adrian Beltre does so well, makes contact and enough to get that ball down in the outfield and to drive in two more runs. Simply amazing. 6 to 1 RBIs on the year for Beltre. Season high five already tonight. And the captain with a smile on his face. Rangers with a 5 0 lead and the Mariners into the bullpen. And the Rangers continuing to work here with the third inning. Our who's in, who's out pitching change. Sponsored by In-N-Out Burger. Roanis Elias is the man who is in. And Erasmo Ramirez out. And Ramirez is still responsible for the base runner, Adrian Beltre. But Elias coming in for the 21st time. You see the overall number is pretty good for him. Not a big strikeout rate for him. More of a contact pitcher, but has done a pretty good job filling up the strike zone. And what you'll see from Elias is a good fastball, one that averages at 94 miles an hour. You'll also see that curveball and that changeup as well. And the splits, not as favorable as you might think against lefties. They've hit 300 against him this season. He's actually done a very nice job against righties. Right-handed batters have hit just 214 against this left-hander. So those backward splits, but nevertheless, Scott Service still wants to bring him in against the lefty and give him an opportunity to face Ruben Odor. Odor popped out in the first inning, 0 for 1. And first pitch from Elias, that one in there for strike one. Beltre, by the way, with the uh, Five RBIs tonight. It gives him 1,703 in his career. He's passed 
Jim Tomey. Reggie Jackson is 23rd on the all time list there. One ball, one strike on Odor. Three runs in the first, two runs here in the third, and Odor very high in the air. Foul on that first base side, and it's a souvenir. Nice reach. All right, so five RBIs for Adrian Beltre tonight. We're only in the bottom of the third inning. Any idea? Career high, single game, Adrian Beltre? Seven. Done this for a long time. Six. He's wow. done it twice. So maybe a little personal history for Adrian Beltre. Oh, look at these guys. I just say it, and the graphic just pops up. Boom! <laughs> This one hit hard out to right field. That's a base hit. Back-to-back to back two out singles. And the inning continues. Well, I mentioned the struggles against lefties for Elias this year. Now, the first breaking ball that he threw to Rudy Odor was a pretty good one. That one, though, Stayed up in the zone, and Rugi having a very nice season. We've talked a lot about the offensive adjustments he has made, and you know, coming into tonight with a 260 batting average against lefties, you'll take that from Rugi and Odor, and that success continues with that base hit right there. Torinos pulls this one through the left side of the infield. Beltre will be stopped, and the bases are loaded. Three consecutive singles. The bases are loaded for Joey Gallo. Good job by Robinson Torinos to keep things moving here with new pitcher coming in. And gets that pitch down. It's a ground ball to the left side. And the Rangers have put together a nice two-out rally together. So runners everywhere. On the first pitch, Gallo takes low. Joey walked in the second inning. Look at the last seven games for Joey. The, the number's very good. Left-handed slugger. He's never hit a grand slam. One and one. In fact, this year with the bases loaded, Gallo is 0 for 10. You think He'd be the last guy you'd want to see as an opposing pitcher with the bases loaded. There you see Beltre, Odor, and Chirinos third to first. I can't imagine that Gallo could get shut out for the year with the bases loaded. I'm with you on that. That one off the glove. And nobody moves up. Two and on the count. Gallo already with a career high 87 RBIs this year. Last year hit 41 homers. He's at 37 this year with a little better than a week to go. 2-1. That's a good pitch. Evens account. 94 right on the corner after Joey was looking at a couple of those breaking balls. Always makes that fastball play up a little bit higher. And listen, 94 is a good fastball. But those are three breaking balls that were swept away. Only one of those in the strike zone. That gives that fastball a little bit more of an advantage. Full count now. So what do you think? When three curveballs, two fastballs, do you try to flip that curveball in there for a strike? You certainly don't want to walk Joey Gallo, and so it's a matter of what are you most comfortable which pitch are you most comfortable throwing a strike with here? The problem is, you know that Joey Gallo can absolutely murder a fastball. I mean, any pitch for that matter, but especially a fastball. 3-2 pitch, and that one is off the plate ball four, so a bases loaded walk. And it's 6-0 Rangers. Joey has walked twice tonight. 
That's really good patience, and you're in a situation where your club is already up 5 nothing. We know Joey Gallo, the approach is trying to do damage, change the scoreboard, right? He's talked about that. Bunch of RBIs sitting out there. We're talking, who could he get to 100, right? We just had that conversation, and boy, Grand Slam certainly would make that happen pretty quickly. That's great patience. And Calhoun absolutely lashes that one foul. Woo. He got some barrel on that one, but just too far out in front. I wonder after what he had seen to Odor, first pitch breaking ball, Joey Gallo, first pitch breaking ball, if maybe he was sitting or at least looking for that curveball, that's why he was out in front of the heater. One and one the count. So Elias has come on. Give up the single to Odor, the base hit to Chirinos, and then walked Gallo with the bases loaded. And you can close the book on Erasmo Ramirez, two and two thirds innings. He allowed six runs on four hits and two walks. Well, the breaking ball, that's off the plate, two and one to count. Calhoun is the ninth batter of the inning for the Rangers. Up the middle. And therefore, it is Segura. And he'll go to the bag. The inning is over. Rangers will have to settle for the three runs. Five RBIs for Adrian Beltre tonight. And it's last inning. The base hit to right. Drives in two more. He's one shy of a career high tonight. Far five RBIs. Uh, the veteran, 39 years old. Meanwhile, this youngster, just 23 years old, Ariel Arado, two scoreless innings so far under his belt as the primary pitcher tonight. And he puts the first one to Denard Span right on the outside corner for strike one. Span hit one to center field. In the second inning, he's 0 for 1. So a couple of fastballs like that from Gerardo to the left. He's where that ball ends up running way off the plate more than he wants it to. Looks like he might be spinning out. It was mechanics just a little bit. Weak roller out to second base. Span retired, and we're underway here in the fourth. Well, hard to believe it, but coming up this Sunday will be Fan Appreciation Day. Fans get a 2018 Rangers team photo, complete with next year's schedule on the back. Also, fans will get a voucher for a free ticket to select games in 2019, and we're giving away every inning during the game 
uh, lots of different things uh, including autographed baseballs jerseys etc. You get your tickets at TexasRangers.com or call 972 Rangers. Two balls no strikes to Ben Gamble who lined out in the second. Right handed pitcher, you kind of like seeing that big swing, even though it was a big swing and a comfortable swing from Ben Campbell. I think Corrado knows if he can hit his spots, it's the kind of swing you can take advantage of. And certainly Robinson Trinos knows that. And that's a nice feeling, I think, for Corrado as well, is that when you have that catcher back there that picks up on those swings, adjusts accordingly. You see him telling him, come straight toward me, stay through me a little bit longer. And I mentioned, right, that there was balls that were running off the plate. Because he was probably spinning off to the first base side. Chirinos noticed that. That's that kind of sign that you give to your catcher. Bring your body toward me. Don't spin off too early. So the sinker will stay a little bit more true, not get too big. Looks cool on TV to see a lot of movement, but that's not always what you want as a pitcher. You want that smaller, tighter movement. That's a little bit more effective. Ooh, strike three called. He gets Gamble looking two away. So I want you to notice this as well on that replay. Look what Robinson Trinos has set up. It's middle in. Why? Because he knows that ball is running a little bit more than usual tonight. So he probably thought, yes, away is the best location based on what we've seen so far with the swings. And catchers will do that sometimes. They'll go ahead and set up middle in if a guy's pulling off and the ball's running too much. Romino pops one out over second base. And what a running play by Rugnet Odor. Continues his excellent season defensively. By showing some big time range right there, inning over. That's a great inning for the Rangers. Nice job by Gerardo after they put up three, and it's capped off with a Rugnet Odor. Great defensive play in short left center field. The news that Jeff Bannister relieved of his duties and this is fourth year not a surprise he handled it with class I want to thank Rangers ownership and John Daniels for giving me this opportunity we had some great times here but it didn't last forever I want to thank the coaches field staff especially the players who made it an honor for me to wear a Rangers uniform and to the fans I can't tell you how much I've appreciated your support and kind words over the four years I sincerely regret that we are not able to take make a deeper run for you in 2015 and 16. Now he Listen, Banny was as popular as they come uh, among the fan base yeah. and whatnot. Don Wakabatsu, the now interim manager for the Rangers. And uh, of course, we all who got to know Banny well over the last couple of years wish him nothing but the best. I know he will be back in the game with someone next year, maybe the year after. I know it kind of depends on him, really, but a great baseball man. And, and he, no doubt, did great things here. And, and I think. John Daniels 
to his credit today too. I mean, he didn't shy away from that either. He's a, the, the guy had a lot of success here. Did a lot of great things for us. It just seemed like the time for a quote unquote new voice. We had that conversation earlier, right, with John Daniels about that. And he said, you know, letting players go, you always feel like, oh, there's going to be another opportunity. But it's when you're letting staff go and coaches that it's really difficult because. One of the things that the Rangers do so well is that they actually genuinely care about the people in their organization. They don't fake it. They don't give lip service. They actually mean it. And that's obvious. It shows up. You can tell. You spend any time around this organization on the inside, and you pick up on that pretty quickly. And so it was a really difficult decision today to have to go through that and have the conversations that are uncomfortable that you don't want to have. And not that people really care, but Banny was great with us, too. And I've known Jeff Bannister since 2005, my time with the Pirates in the minor leagues when he was in their system as a rover and then eventually a big league coach. And he was really great with us, which makes our job a little bit easier as far as having conversations about the team, and giving great insight to some strategies and players and all that kind of stuff. It was hugely helpful. So but from my standpoint, personally, was disappointed. You understand what the Rangers are doing. They got to think about their organization and make whatever decision they think is best. But that's a loss for all of us. A little pop up out of the short right field. Gamble thought maybe that that was going to be handled by D. Gordon. Oh, and Profar gets to second base. The ball thrown away again and into the dugout. Little League Homer. Jerickson Profar will go all the way around the bases on a pop up into short right field. How about that? <laughs> well, I don't see that one every day. You definitely do not. I don't know. Listen, if Ben Gamble called that ball or not, but D. Gordon had a beat on that pop up. He was going to catch it. And for whatever reason, he bailed out. Either he heard Ben Gamble, Gamble was calling him off, or he heard, thought he heard something that he didn't hear. But you watch him here, he's going to have the season. Let's see if we can see Ben Gamble calling for it. We do not. He decides to go for it. And then the throw was just completely unnecessary. Whenever that throw comes from the outfield and leaves the field of play, it is a two base advance. And so it's a double and an error, but that is straight out of the bad news bears. Yeah, try Another again. opportunity. <laughs> Out to short right field. This time, Gamble does get to it. Two away. So, yeah, there's the ball. And I mean, look at that. Look at the coaches just looking at him. Scott Service, I don't mean to laugh, but he knows exactly as that ball is rolling in the dugout that Jerks and Profar is going to be allowed to score. And he's thinking, you got to be kidding me. We just had a pop out to our second baseman. Like no, yeah, nothing you do as a coach. It's helpless. You're watching that ball roll in, and you're like, "Yeah, that's going to roll in the dugout, and that's going to be a little league homer." Wow. Well, it's just a couple of days too late for our little league yep. broadcast, we where we actually you. highlighted one of his great little league home runs <laughs> that went over the fence. This was uh, this one stayed in the yard. Mazzara takes very high, two and zero. Oh. So seven nothing Rangers. Nomar 0 for two. I didn't see Ben Gamble calling him off. Did you? I I thought I did. Oh, you did. Yeah, I thought I saw him on that replay, saying he had it. And then what he did was he looked down. He you know took his eyes off the ball from him to see if Gordon was going to get out of the way. And I think that's where things went sideways. Oh, oh. Tell. I mean, this D. Gordon must have heard something, right? He would have just bailed out like that. And yeah. that throw was not near anybody. That was the, that that was was the second part that was a little harder, I'm sure, to accept. This one fouled away. Oh, yeah, there he goes. You're right. Right that's, that look right there. Yeah. Yes. And then he stopped. And that's one of my when I'm coaching kids, not to get back to the little neck, that's one of the biggest pet peeves. Because they all want to catch it. Like as soon as off the bat, like three kids are calling for the ball, and I was telling you, if you're gonna call it, you better be able to catch it. Yeah. It, it happens. It's going to happen in Little League. You're going to see it. That second baseman's gonna call a pop-up that's between the first baseman and the pitcher, and he's not gonna be able to get there in time to catch it, and he should have never called it to begin with. But my rule is if you call it, you better catch it. And you better at least have a chance to catch it. <laughs> Three two. 
And Omar hits this one to the left side of the infield. Only one man there, but he hit it right at him. And the inning is over. The Rangers pick up an unlikely run, however. And we'll go to the bottom of the fourth inning. Rangers leading 7-0. Where we stand, uh, you know, I, we have not been in, in contention for, for most of the season. Um, that's not what what this decision is about. In fact, if anything, the the record of the club that, that falls on me. Um, you know, I'm the one that ultimately uh, leads the decisions on, on putting together our roster. Uh, made the decision to trade you know many of our best pitchers, uh, and and I accept that. That was John Daniels as this ball hit well out to right field and Mazzara you know, kind of sliced away on him a little bit with D. Gordon's speed. That's going to be trouble. He has a stand up triple to open this fifth inning. Anyway, I think for John Daniels, that was big of him to step in and take responsibility sure. for this year as well. We talked about Jeff Bannister and his statement and in the class with which he handled things today and I think uh, John Daniels also was some class today pointing out that wasn't this record wasn't his fault it was my fault and we just need to move on it is a classy move because it would be very easy to blame anybody that's outgoing in the organization of any failures from this season RBI ground out to second base by Hanager and there's the first run of the night for the Mariners. And it's not surprising either I mentioned about John Daniels the way that this organization is run from top to bottom and accountability is important and certainly not trying to kick anybody while they're down. And I don't think it was an easy decision you know fans have really strong opinions about coaches and managers. And we get to hear those every once in a while on social media and I just ignore most of it quite honestly. We'll chopper to second base and O'Dor good hustle throw to get Segura to a way. But the reality is is that it's really difficult I think to evaluate your managers and your coaching staff like when you look at if you're, let's say you're looking at some coaches and you got a hitter who's beating expectations is that enough to say this guy's doing a great job with this you don't know and then you have some others that are struggling and I feel like a lot of times just in general big picture the coaches end up taking the blame probably more than they deserve. It's a really difficult job and you've seen those numbers increase the rosters right two hitting coaches two pitching coaches because there's so much work to be done and I think John Daniels did a nice job of kind of alleviating some of that blame that some people may put on a manager for a season like this and I think he nailed that one. Two outs and the one old pitch to Cano a little bit in. Cano for one with a walk. The owners got their first run of the night here in this fifth inning. Well, that one down.
down the left field line. It's two and one. So it's the really it's just the beginning of what could be a you know a longer process to really determine where the Rangers are going to go with all of this. You do know this much Jeff Bannister as of today will no longer be involved in this process. But again John Daniels thanking him and showing some appreciation for what he had done Don Wakamatsu who has done a little managing himself and has been a part of this Rangers organization on a number of different occasions gets the job here in the interim. Two two and that one rolled out into right field that's a base hit for Cano. Wakamatsu managed for the Mariners and it was just a 20 games under 500 during his short stint with Seattle. But he has served on the staff for the Rangers for each of the last three full time managers and had those back to back World Series runs as a bench coach in Kansas City. A lot of success, a, a great career, great resume for Wakamatsu. And he was also asked about who would basically fill his role for the time being. He said Jason Wood tonight, AAA manager. We'll see if that continues. I don't think there's any final decisions that have been made in that regard. No, it wasn't real clear that we were going to play tonight. In yeah. fact, and that was that almost came through in the in the press conference today. I think there was there's some expectation on both sides that we might have just been rained out. But fortunately, a lot of the the bad stuff has avoided us tonight, and we've been able to play. But he he said at the time, yeah, well, Woody tonight, and we'll see. We, we got to figure a lot of things out. High fly ball out into short right field. Mazzara with that long run. Are they able to track it down? And the inning is over. Well, don't go anywhere. We're going to the bottom of the fifth inning. You don't want to miss it. Adrian Beltre has already driven in five runs tonight. He'll lead things off when we come back. Get one guess at who it is, and it is indeed Adrian Beltre. Opposite field home run for him. And then this little fluke base hit. They're driven a couple of more, and it has been a five RBI night for Adrian Beltre as he now steps in for his third plate appearance here. It's the fifth inning. We need just one more RBI to tie his career high of six. Let's see if we got an opportunity to do that before this game is over. A hole here, 0 oh and 2. And that home run that he hit in the first inning is 14th of the season. Seven of the 14 have been in the month of September. Well, he has had a huge month. 
Well, that's who you'd love to play that game, right? Well, if he was healthy all year, it's a 40 home run season. We'll tie again, two and two. Our Windstar World Casino and Resort leaderboard. There you see it, 120 home runs here at Globe Life Park. Only Rafael Palmero with 130 has hit more here. That one line foul. <laughs> what a play. And really standing up is optional when you're catching foul balls. If you're in the right spot, you got your glove. I think he caught that. Seated. Wow. Two two pitch. Get the sense that wasn't their first foul ball. Uh, Kids are that willing pretty, to give yeah. away. Unless they unless they had some friends a couple of rows in front of them maybe or I don't know. So you saw there that Adrian was 10 away. Most home runs in his ballpark. It's another reason to come back. <laughs> Strikes out here to start the fifth inning. One away. 24 home runs and at least 10 at home. Oh. Right? <laughs> well, you can take your Rangers fandom to the next level and own a piece of the game. You can see how you can get everything from game used baseballs to, to bases and a lot of autograph memorabilia. Check it out. TexasRangers.com slash authentics. One out and Odor takes up and in. Rugi one for two. Odor has had the great second half. Overall, it's going to end up looking like a really good year. And he's a guy right now trying to find once again what it was that had him streaking after the all-star break he has slowed down quite a bit lately one and two to count up down to sixth in the order these last couple of games And this one out to just the left of center field. Another hit for Odor, his second of the night. Well, those are good signs. I think also where he has hit both of those, right? We see Ruggi when he's using the entire field. And you can see this about any hitter. It makes you feel confident that the swing is where you want to see it. But then also against the lefty, right? Two base hits against Elias here this evening. That's two base hits. Against the left hand. And another hanging breaking ball, too. That's good to see that he's not missing those, that he's not pulling off of them. Now, a ground ball shortstop. Gordon takes it at second, flips it on to first for the double play. 6 4 3, inning over. And we'll go to the sixth inning tonight, where the Rangers lead it 7 1.
be. Visit your local GMC dealer today. And by the Texas Department of Transportation, who remind you to click it or ticket, day and night. Well, we go to the sixth. 7-1, Rangers lead. Ariel Lorado getting some run support tonight. Lorado has allowed just the one run so far. Gordon with the triple and then scored on the RBI ground out. So the plan so far has really worked out well for the Rangers and as we go through this opener and I'm sure for a lot of fans it I think it's worth repeating kind of the conversation of why teams are doing this. So in the case of the Rangers they bring in Harado to start at the sixth spot in the order with the idea that if he can get deep into the game he doesn't have to face the top part of the order third time through. So currently right now facing Kyle Seeger who then faced Denard Span next for the third time in the game. So when he gets to the third time through the order he's actually doing it on the bottom half instead of the top half. Which never is going to be perfect and work out exactly the way that you want it to but that is the idea that it, you know you can get a would be starter to face anywhere from 19 to 23 hitters without having to see that middle of the order a third time. Put him in a better chance to succeed. Right and instead of that point coming in the fifth inning. Maybe you get to the sixth and now most teams I, I just feel like most teams feel like they have a seven eight nine kind of rotation in their bullpen for handling the lead and I think that's a big part of it is a line out to left field is out number one if you feel like you can get your starter by using an opener to help him there get him through let's say six innings well, most teams feel pretty good going yeah. seven eight nine it's when you have to bridge from a shorter start let's say four or five innings and get to that seventh inning that oftentimes teams run into trouble ground ball second base and an easy hop for Odor two away All right, time for Chevy game break let's check in again with John Radigan. Babe, thank you, John. <laughs> One can only hope. Which is automatic update, regardless of what's going on. The other part too is you let the score kind of dictate, you know, what happens next, right? So we saw some action in the Ranger bullpen, but here is Hirado at 67 pitches, third time through the order. If he can get through Ben Gamble, I don't know. I think about maybe giving him an opportunity to go back out there, face 891 potentially. Maybe not. There's always that upside and the idea of allowing a guy to have a nice, clean, positive finish. I don't know. For me, in September, even though you got a lot of arms down there that you would like to see, I do think you have to prioritize some of those arms. And for me, Harada was a guy that gets some priority that you maybe you push a little bit. Two balls, two strikes. He did a great job. Remember the leadoff triple by D. Gordon? Yeah. Right at that time, the Rangers were already up at 7 0 at the time, but he comes back and he just. Pump strikes and doesn't get behind anybody, doesn't walk anybody. Gets a couple of ground outs, another single, another out. Just kind of cruising along really nicely. This is the good version. We've seen it a couple of times. That great start that he had in Houston. A lot of fun to watch early on. Two two pitch and that one in the left field, a base hit for Gamble. Well, the watch for tonight is that they have such a large lead. Yeah. And that allows you to extend him a little bit and push. Nice job by Big Gamble to line that ball the opposite way. But I mentioned, I think the total number of hitters is really what you look at. Yes, you'd love to have innings, but what is the reality of this primary pitcher, whatever the ultimate name is going to be for him? But it's 20 batters faced right now for Harada. Right, so here comes number. 21 that's about that range 
But again, the score allows you to maybe push it a little bit if you want to. We'll see how things go here. If he gets out of this, so we can take him out, let it be clean, or do you try to push to see, hey, let's get up to 24, 25 hitters and see how that goes. But based on the fact that Butler is up, yeah. my guess is this will probably be close to the end. Yeah, I think we're getting our answer. This ball out the left field. Calhoun to his left, and it's off his glove. Gamble around third. He'll score. It's an RBI double for Zanino. I, I presume we'll have to wait and see. I don't, I don't know if you can give that a double or not. I think it'll go down as a double. We'll see. Willie Calhoun had a long way to go. And this would have been, I don't know, call probably a very good play to get there. We know he's still learning the outfield. We talked about that earlier. He got there, yeah, just in and out of the glove. He almost overran it a little bit. So Zanino at second, scored a double. Seven to two the score. Now D. Gordon, who tripled his last time up. Well, that one foul. So with the righty Butler up, a couple of righties do next, and Hanniger and Segura. I'd feel pretty confident saying this is probably the last hitter for Harado. When you talk about taking a risk, feeling good about probably it being the last hitter. That's that's being definitive and really going out on the soft liner to short, and that will do it. And so Harado. They're likely done after six innings tonight. Well, five and a half anyway. Rangers lead by five. We remind you to click it or tick it, day and night. All right, seven to two. Rangers with the lead, and they were back here in the bottom of the sixth inning. And James Pazos will be the new pitcher for Seattle. Yeah, good numbers for him. This is a really tough lefty with some pretty good stuff. And for Pazos, the Rangers have seen him quite a bit. 94 miles an hour on the fastball. The slider is very good. That's been averaging 79. But he has struggled against lefties this year. I'd say struggled, but below average for him. 262. You'd expect those numbers to be a little bit lower. 240 against right-handers so far this season. 8.3 on the strikeout rate. And just a slightly above average ground ball rate at 47%. Now Joey Gallo will lead things off. He's been up twice. He's walked twice. Once with the bases loaded. Which gives him now 88 RBIs for the year. This time leading things off. And he'll hit this one high in the air. 
Deep out to center field, going back for that one, and gone! Hanniger gave it a look, but there's no shot. 38th of the year for Gallo. Rangers back to a six-run lead. We talked about the really good at-bat that Joey Gallo had with the bases loaded back in the third inning, and the patience pays off, right? I mean, all those things can kind of carry over, didn't chase that borderline pitch, and gets one here sitting right in the middle of the plate. It's a 92-mile-an-hour fastball, two-seam fastball, but it did not have very much movement. Joey Gallo crushes that thing deep in the center field. 432 feet. At an exit velocity of 110 miles per hour. So a smash by Joey Gallo. Delano to Shields pinch hitting here for Willie Calhoun. And he takes high. Bottom of the sixth. It's an 8 2 ball game. And this one, again, up a little high. 2 0. Oh. So Joey, look at batted balls over 110 miles per hour. Joey with 37 of them now. Fourth most in baseball. Two and one. Gallo also now three home runs the last four games. And another one off a left hander. It continues to be a big story. He's had 15 off left handed pitching. Two and two. So the Shields this year, he's only pinch hit once. He's 0 for 1. And he struck out too, right? I think it was a couple of nights ago we saw that, if I'm not mistaken. And he strikes out again here. Foul tip into the glove, one away. Hey, MLB at bat is your number one Rangers app. Customize your experience and take advantage of great features like the MLB.tv game of the day. Download MLB at bat today. Easy to do. Is she wearing a Red Sox t shirt? Yeah, we got a wayward Red Sox fan here. It's all right. All are welcome. Might be an advanced scout. <laughs> Gonna jump on next year's prep. Two one for well, two. Not gonna be here till September. Oh, so significant jump. <laughs> yeah, I gotta take into account the weather and all that. It's a ballpark play this time of year. Yes. Maybe that's why, right? <laughs> What's it going to be like the last week in September? Next year. 2019. <laughs> Go there now. Scout it out. Oh, that's fan. Poor thing. 2 0 pitch. And two bounces this one down to first base. Cano has it. And he'll feed Pazos. Two away. Well, it's time for Built for Baseball, which is brought to you by T Mobile. And we know that Jerickson Profar has proven to us this year he is very much built for baseball. You see him make this nice defensive play at first base. And then. A little league homer. It should have been a pop out, but instead it turned into a double, and then it was the gift. It just kept on giving as that throw rolled all the way into the dugout, which allowed George and Profar to advance two bases. And maybe not quite as fun as the home run that he hit in the Little League World Series, but fun nonetheless. So Jerickson here. Owen won the count. Batting second tonight. Inside the final two weeks of the season. Like the regular season will end 
next Sunday the Rangers will wrap up the regular season in Seattle. So a lot of the Mariners here in these final two weeks seven of the last ten games against Seattle. I think we'll be in for a temperature shock when we get to Seattle. I'm a feeling it's How was it in the Bay Area when you guys were up there is it I, mean, I feel like I haven't been chilly at a game since April. Yeah it wasn't too bad this one hit well out to left field and tracked down out there by span. It was like upper 60s but Elvis had the ear flaps down. That's right. <laughs> Solo home run of the inning by Gallo. The Rangers lead it eight to two. Seventh inning, and about our Kubota power stats. Openers and primary pitchers in September for the Rangers. A marathon of innings and a 3.38 ERA. That that has worked well. Well, it has, and I think another part of that too is the length that you get out, which really matters too. And for the most part, that's been very successful for the Rangers. But the Shields stays in the game in center field, and Gallo slides over to left. Eddie Butler comes on here in the seventh. Take a look at the numbers for Eddie Butler. These are combined with the Cubs and the Rangers this year. Game number 26 for him with the 25 strikeout, 17 walks in 45 innings so far. Last couple of outings have been good for him. Really, he's been on a nice little run here as of late. You go all the way back to September 8th and look at Eddie Butler's line. He's thrown the ball pretty well here lately. Totals for him and over those five games, a 2.25 ERA. Ball hit sharply by third and into left field. Hanniger digs for second base and he will be in there. Lead off double in this seventh inning. Well, Hanniger's been on twice tonight now. You mentioned how good he has been in the leadoff spot. It's rare that you get multiple opportunities to actually lead off an inning. Good look at the four seam fastball grip and not a bad pitch at all. Pretty well located down and in, but Hanniger's able to hit it hard enough down the line. And Adrian Beltre has got no chance. And it's an easy leadoff double. So right away, Butler has to deal with a base runner. Gene Segura, the hitter, and that one off the plate outside. Segura 0 for 3 is flied out and grounded out on a couple of occasions. One in the dirt goes to the backstop. Hanniger moves to third base on the wild pitch. Not a good start to the seventh inning for Eddie Butler. See that change up right there. Good look at the grip and he pulled it straight down. Look like he was really trying to make sure he got downward movement but just kind of overcompensated a little bit. And 
Ended up spiking that, even yanking it a little bit. Three and zero. Rangers up by six. But Alex Claudio getting ready in that bullpen in a hurry. Depending on what happens here with Segura, who knows? We might see Claudio. Those five of the next seven hitters are lefties. Three and one. Fellow Andrew Simon on Twitter from Statcast. Pretty interesting guy. Always got some. He doesn't tweet out a ton. He's got some really good information. But he just mentioned that. Uh, Joey's home run with the 15 home runs against lefties this year. It's the first since Adam Dunn to have that many back in 2012. And we're talking a little bit about how there's a lot of similarities between the two as hitters, although Joey's the first to try to stay away from any comps as far as other players in the past. See it there, 15 home runs against left handed pitchers. So as a lefty, of course, against lefties. Ties the team record that Rafael Palmero set back in. Is that 2003? Yep. I did my best to help him in that category. Not that year, though. Palmero got me a couple times. Let's see what happened here with Robbie on this foul tip. It's again, the follow through. Oh, yeah. well, I don't think he didn't foul tip that, did he? Didn't look like he hit that ball. Mm -hmm. He may not have. It was treated as a foul tip, yeah. which only helped the Rangers. Three two. This one out to center field. That'll drop in. Base hit. And Hanniger in from third base. A double. An RBI single. It's an 8-3 ball game. Don Wakamatsu out of that dugout and signals to the bullpen. So Eddie Butler comes in and cannot get it out. And so the lefty, Claudio, on to face a barrage of lefties coming from the Mariners here in a moment. Put your popcorn hat on anyway. That's nice. That is <laughs> really smart usage there. And then, of course, with the cotton candy in the bag, keep that dry as well. well Look at that guy. Get it, all in there. Get it all off your fingers. <laughs> smell it. Rub it on your T-shirt. Now stick your hand in there and give some more to your brother. Yeah. His brother wasn't satisfied with two. A little more. Alex Claudio on here in the seventh inning. Game number 62 there for Alex. Did another excellent job with the walks. Just 12 of those in 64 innings. He's been good over his last six. Just one run allowed over that time. Five strikeouts and a couple of walks. So Alex has been throwing the ball well here lately. Well, he's off the plate. 
for a ball to Robinson Cano, who has walked and singled tonight, one for two. It's just off the plate again. Two and zero. Is it possible that we get under 70 degrees? It's 74 degrees right now here with the rain. Could we? That's pretty significant. Get, get down that 60s. far. Yeah. Two zero. Oh. Mm, it's a strike. Well, this game was in peril today, most of the day. And all sorts of really harrowing weather predictions about the rain tonight and whether we'd ever even throw a pitch. As we play here in the seventh now and really been undisturbed tonight. It's like a rumor mill around here, right? At the press box level when there's rain. What'd you hear? Who'd you hear yeah. it from, right? Yeah. Oh, we're going to play. It's going to be a regular doubleheader tomorrow. It's going to start <laughs> at three, right? All, all, it's not going to be a split and all this stuff that goes around and around and. Yeah. It's worse than MLB trade rumors up here. 2 1. Funny who catches a corner. The only thing more predictable than that rumor mill that you talked about yeah. on the days where there's some rain expected is conversation about the quote unquote window that may <laughs> exist. And I think there's going to be a window at 6.45 to 7.30. It's always a window that might allow us to get a little bit in. 2 2. And this ball out to right field. That will drop in for a base hit. So Guerra to second, Cano at first. And second hit of the night for Cano. And that brings up Nelson Cruz. As he delivered, Nelson Cruz. And Cruz, the only right hander among the first. Five hitters that Claudio could potentially see this inning, or at least in the lineup. We'll see here for Alex. Obviously, the idea here is to try to keep the ball on the ground with Nelson Cruz. He has grounded into 14 double plays this season. We know Alex is really good in these spots. He's got himself nine double plays himself. The ground ball rate is at 63%. For Alex Claudio, that is nearly 20% above league average. He needs one right here. Uh, he had a lot of opportunities to face Cruz. Low, one and one. Cruz two for four against him. So a couple of walks. There's Cano at first and Segura. Out there at second base. A run across. Still nobody out. Two and one. So a little surprising that the batting average is a few points lower against lefties for Nelson Cruz than right. He's not much. 258 to 264 coming in. So just six points. But the OPS, the on pace plus the slugging, is significantly higher against left handers. That OPS 920 this year, 855. Against righties, both really good numbers, but significantly higher against lefties. He took that big swing on that changeup and ended up swinging right through it. And that little bit of rain that Matt came flying out of his hand. I don't know if it's because of the rain or just because of how hard he swung. It's always weird when it's the bottom hand that falls off the bat. It was actually a fastball to take that back. Two seam fastball in the corner. He missed that by a pretty good amount. Decent way to hurt yourself. Two balls, two strikes. Cruz 0 for 2 of the walk. And it's a full count. Changeup's been cutting a little bit tonight so far for Alex. We've seen a couple of those that have gone in. And as much as we talk about Jose Leclerc, who does that intentionally, I don't think Alex wants to necessarily cut that changeup into a right hander like Cruz. The better version is the one that kind of tumbles and even fades away a little bit to righties. That's Jose.
We'll tap her foul. We'll do it again. That was about perfect. He threw that two seam fastball right on the corner, down and away. Cruz was able to foul it off. As you see those double barrels going on down in the Ranger bullpen. Seventh pitch of the at bat. And a bouncer third base. Beltre to second. Odor on to first. Double play. There's a little lift for Alex Claudio. Five to four to three. And there are two gone. Great back to back execution from the lefty Alex Claudio going up against a really tough right. righty. First it was the fastball. That time it was the changeup right at the bottom of the zone, outer third. It was a hard hit ground ball, but the Rangers have been so good at turning these double plays, especially with a guy like Cruz running. That's a nice job all the way around. And for the Rangers now, it is double play number 156 turned on the season. Brings just a little more rain with it. It's Kyle Seeger. He will foul off strike one Seeger 0 for 3. I wonder how many times he's seen a change up up and in from the lefty this year. That pitch was up and in and off the plate and he still swung at it. He's probably laughing about it a little bit as he has struggled mightily. You see the numbers against Alec Claudio 1 for 12. Ground screw. Looking like they're poised. This will be interesting. Two out here with the seventh inning. Segura at third. And that one way inside. It's one and one. Yeah, for Dennis Klein and the crew. I mean, this is their baby, that field. And they know that obviously the Rangers want to continue playing. At the same time, they're always concerned about the damage and making sure the field's not taking up too much water. Smiling right now. For now, we'll see how long that lasts if this rain continues to pick up. And strike two. And I wonder if they'll be just a tad more careful with a game plan tomorrow and a lot more rain coming. Well, they're not going to quite get through this top of the seventh with a count of ball and two strikes. Uh, Dennis Klein and company going to have to cover the field. So the umpire crew pulls them off the field. Rangers with the five run lead. And here comes the tarp. That is coming down quickly. And that was probably a pretty good call right there on the part of Larry Vanover to get him off in a hurry. Now on the one hand, you're thinking, well, yeah, I'd, you know, I'd like to get that final out of the inning. On the other hand, one strike away, too. Yeah. I mean, but you probably shouldn't do that as an umpire, right? I mean, that's the thing. You sit there, we're watching, you might be watching, oh, let's, let's try to get that last out, but 